Hello friends, <coughs> as you know we have been running a series for quite some time and uh, now we are on the last legs and uh, very soon we have, to, we have to start a new series also and uh, there are certain conclusions that have been reached uh, in, uh, during the discussions and uh, you are aware of them now, you must have already mulled over the points that uh, the team as a whole, all of us team members were making uh, in, in the lecture series. And uh, today's lecture by uh, Professor Richa Bajaj is uh, <coughs> uh, the penultimate lecture, there, there might be one more uh, next month. And uh, we are uh, in, the, in that sense are trying to, uh, you know, uh, relate uh, and, and formulate certain conclusions uh, regarding the uh, place that we have discussed. Uh, Professor Richa Bajaj uh, has taken up uh, 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 in a very significant way the, the issue of American drama in the 20th century. And today's play that, that, that she is taking up and the dramatist she is taking up, uh, the, the play is The Odd Couple and, and, and the playwright is <coughs> Neil Simon. Uh, before I request her to begin, let me make a general point and I would like to seek her opinion on this. And uh, that is that uh, most of these uh, uh, playwrights are coming from America or England, if not, if not most, many of them uh, come from the Jewish background. Now that, you know, uh, takes us into the question of the alienation of the Jewish community right from the time Shakespeare uh, took it up in the dramatic mode. And uh, these people have taken largely to, uh, broadly to and strongly uh, to, to drama writing and, uh, you know, uh, uh, evolving a kind of perspective that was critical at times, but not in the sense in which Jewish would uh, make it. Shylock would, would, would complain about it in Merchant of Venice. That's not what they do. What they do is that uh, they are able to uh, liberate themselves from the uh, restrictive background of the Jewish uh, you know, community, the, the Jewish point of view, and, and, and they become outstanding intellectuals in their own right. I do not have to refer to many Jewish writers starting from Noam Chomsky in the, in the 20th century, and uh, the uh, uh, playwright from Britain, uh, Harold Pinter was a Jew, today's writer also is a Jew, and uh, we believe that uh, they have uh, a kind of internality that is because of uh, being Jews and uh, they, they are not there uh, in, in, in practice that and they, they are extra sharp and critical and uh, uh, like uh, Harold Pinter is known as a comic writer and uh, Neil Simon also I am told uh, is, 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 broad, is, is intensely into comedy. So which means that uh, they take their, their world, their life lightly, intelligently, they, they, they provoke to, uh, us to think. And uh, there are certain points in common, you know, with, with the uh, modern ideas of uh, enlightenment, modern ideas of looking at things with a kind of tolerance, with a kind of inclusiveness, uh, so far as they are concerned. So would you agree with me, Professor Pajad, when I say this, this thing about the Jewish writer in, in particular in the 20th century? <coughs> Yes, I think uh, particularly in the case of America, uh, it's the American Jewish intellectual that have saved really uh, American life. So, uh, in that sense, you know, in fact, uh, when, when we look at the Jews in America, the Jews intellectuals, it is so that, uh, you know, they have a sense of past and they have a sense of history that they want to talk about. In fact, you have a writer, for instance, there is a critic called, um, a, tr a critic named Michael Wolf. He, in fact, uh, mentioned that you know that the past in all its forms is a particularly so, potent landscape for the Jewish writer in America and that there are many uh, strategies for exploring that past from high seriousness to comedy. Now, uh, you know, that is the main point of this particular uh, uh, idea around the Jewish community, that the past is a, a particularly a potent landscape for the Jewish writer. and. And this is also true in the case of Neil Simon, you know, he tries to build a sense of past, you know. So, all these Jewish intellectuals, in fact, you know, they have this sense that, um, you know, they, they, they do not deny history, you know. And there is a, there is among the 20th century American writers that, you know, they do not want to do anything with history, they want to reject history. But he, the Jewish intellectuals in America, they constantly harp on history, they constantly harp on their past. So, the past in a way becomes a kind of a carrier of values and also, you know, as you say, they, they look towards this first onset or their migration from Europe to America and how they came and settled it. So, past is a sense of their, that they have this kind of a deep desire to, uh, you know, locate their past, to locate their identity in that past. So, mm -hmm. they, in fact, they, uh, more often than not, they go into this, the landscape 
uh, of you know this in their mind uh, regarding the present situation they are in and the past that uh, they belong to or they might have belonged to or their ancestors belong to so you know when michael wolf uh, says this about uh, neil simon particularly and uh, generally about uh, the writers in the jewish writers that the past in all its forms is particularly potent landscape for the jewish writer in america and there are many strat strategies for exploring that past from high seriousness to comedy much of neil simon's work can be seen within this kind of perspective as represented representative in one form or another a persistent re-examination of the past unquote now a persistent re-examination of the past on the part of a jewish american writer makes one necessarily go back in time to look at the roots and the cause of problem mm -hmm. and which is why you find that neil simon even though he's writing in the post-war american phase he is also uh, referring to uh, the uh, depression years you know the years when he grew up really so I think that uh, being a Jewish American writer, Neil Simon, like Clifford Odets earlier, for instance, um, you know, they have a sense of not just internality, but a sense of history and a sense of uh, a past that they want to connect to, and they want to connect the present American experience with that past. So, you know, they do not want to reject it like many others, you know, who seem to live in, you know, the present absurdities of life. They make sure that the present absurdities in life are located in the larger culture and milieu uh, that gave rise to them. And I think that is what, you know, that they are able to substantiate and contextualize the suffering of the people and uh, uh, connect it with the larger political issues of the day. So, that mm. makes their writing so that, that, That's an important point you are making. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, 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 know from you, your you know, analysis and, and, and your direct comment whether, you know, history also is able to liberate these people uh, who come from certain backgrounds and that they become much more rational than many others. I guess in the in the sense that I don't know, maybe that might just be far fetched that you know that the history liberates them, but history definitely gives them a point on which they can pin their own identity, mm -hmm. you know, and it is important for them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much how far history can liberate them. In fact, they try to do the opposite with it. They want to uh, find their identity through that history. So they don't. In fact, they are uh, more in a free fall in America. Mm -hmm. So unless they pin them to some kind of a historical uh, onset or some kind of a historical moment in time when that migration occurred and how their family lives lived in the following periods, they are unable to locate their own identity. So, in order to locate their identity, history helps them pin them down to uh, the set values that their family stood for, their ancestors came from, all the all of that. One more query: What 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 do you think is uh, something that uh, makes them comic in, in their writing? Not necessarily, not all Jewish writers, I'd say, are comic. Some of them also go into the tragic mode or, you know, uh, for instance, in Clifford Odets, it's more political sort of a narrative that takes shape and more uh, 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 the struggle. I mean, I think, you know, the fact that in, uh, in Clifford Odets, the struggle is very pronounced, you know, and uh, again, you, when you talked of Shylock, I was thought, I was thinking about it that, you know, uh, they are fierce and they want to protest, you know, the wrongs that have been done in history to them, they want to protest against them. So, uh, in Clifford Audits, it finds another route, you know, it's the protest against the larger uh, capitalist culture that Audits hits at. And so, but protest, you know, is, and the fierceness and the passion to fight is there in him and yet when you come to for instance in neil simon he takes the comic turn he takes the humorous turn and in you know and what is important is that this humor is to highlight and underscore this kind of oddity in life you know the the absurdity of life which is not just absurd because it is human but because it is impossible to continue to live in this kind of a world so i think that um, the uh, the com comic connection has more to do with uh, just being unable to solve the issues and the way that the writer finally takes is uh, the way out that the writer finally takes is the comic mode. So I think that's where I'd like to place Neil Simon.
Mm. No, that, that's well said, and I think that this will throw light on your analysis that, 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 that's forthcoming. Right. So, so mm. you know, just to give you a sort of an introduction about Neil Simon as such, uh, let's look at some of his, some of, some, some dates and some of the key uh, areas here. So, the date, the span that we are looking at, so Neil Simon is born in 1927, and he was just there till about 2018. So, uh, you know, he, this, this person grew up in uh, the depression years and uh, was faced with the war, second world war. He also, uh, you know, recruited in the army for a, a small bit and then moved out of it. So, the experience of the war uh, also, uh, you know, is a part of his larger experience. Now, uh, being a Jewish American playwright, he's not, he's written for the Broadway and wrote for the Broadway productions. He was a screenwriter, wrote for uh, television comedies and see, you know the shows that came up. Often his plays were adapted into movies and he also wrote the scripts of those movies. So, you know, he's been in that sense working in various genres of uh, the play, the film, the television uh, comedies and he's, you know, been able to adapt to all these different genres and to these different forms. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1991 and also won the Mark Twain prize for humor in 2006 and uh, we also know that there is a Neil Simon theater uh, a Broadway theater that was you know named uh, after him as a kind of an honor in 1983 now fame of course came to Neil Simon and often he thought that you know he didn't think that he would be able to make it this far and yet fame you know of this kind winning awards and being able to become a famous Broadway uh, writer and a producer even then you know fame didn't really make uh, Simon uh, complacent he was always at the edge you know as he says in one of his introductions that did I sit back and revel in my good fortune did I relax and watch boyhood ambitions being fulfilled before my eyes? Not if you were born in the Bronx, in the Depression, and Jewish, you don't. Unquote. Now, it's very interesting what he says about himself that, you know, it's impossible for me to uh, sit back and enjoy my fame and revel in the good fortune that has come to me and my boyhood ambitions have been fulfilled, etc. So, did I really revel in this? He said, you cannot revel in it, because not if you are born in the Bronx, in the depression and Jewish. So these are the three identities that are very strongly present in Neil Simon as a person. You see, being in the Bronx, let me give you a sense of the Bronx. The South Bronx is the area where mostly the, the poorest, you know, it's the uh, poorest region in New York and uh, the borough. And uh, you find that uh, South Bronx is the, re is the area in New York where most of these, uh, in the 1930s, most of these Jewish, it was a Jewish borough. And uh, also the place which later turned out to be in the post-war periods particularly, it became poverty-stricken. It was the poorest uh, area in New York. So, you know, the fact that, uh, and the working class population mostly lived in the Bronx. So, when he relates himself to this kind of an identity that, you know, you cannot uh, ever revel in your fame if you were born in the Bronx and in the Depression and if you were a Jew. So, you know, these three uh, uh, areas, they tell you a lot about Neil Simon's larger proclivities and as a person, what he was. So, his growing up years, he's seen poverty. He's seen also a broken family, you know, his parents split and the mother was always trying to uh, make ends meet. So, you know, uh, seeing that kind of period of privation, being brought up in a region in New York where, you know, the Jews lived together, but also the area where the poor lived and uh, tracking life of the depression years, you know, how people in the depression years when he was growing up, how he saw his elders uh, cope with the situation uh, at hand. So, the depression uh, years have left an indelible mark on his character and his person and these get reflected in his works, you know, the, the kind of poverty stricken world that one is a part of and very soon, you know, uh, uh, what what you see in southern uh, South Bronx today also, you find that it's almost like America today is a kind of a split nation. You know, it's uh, it's uh, a tale of two cities in, in in many ways. Where on one hand you have the poorest people living there, and the, on the other they are the rich and the professionals and who've made it big. So you know how the middle class. You know his plays are. You know, his plays revolve around the urban middle class experience really and uh, when he talks about this urban middle class uh, experience, then you find that 
he is also talking about how this middle class is steadily being pushed to the poverty so very soon you find that uh, america will not have a middle class and i mean today as we know the middle class is really fading in america it's either the very rich the the affluent sections or the poor uh, service people or the working class that is there so you know the beginnings of it uh, you find neil simon is able to uh, underscore this point that how this middle class is very soon going to be pushed downward in the ladder and uh, you know from this middle class are going to emerge either the professionals who will join the affluent clubs or the services working ordinary people who are going to become a part of this poverty stricken uh, section so you know you can see the the kind of uh, the bind that this particular class is in you know they're trying to find ways of making money they are behind time in paying their um, you know the this their scheduled sort of alimonies etc now all this tells you that they are in in uh, you know in the deep end really and they are very soon going to uh, perish so you know there is this kind of an impending sort of um, uh, life that we can already see in the present forms for instance in the odd couple or barefoot in the park etc they all have a sense of telling us that there is a tragedy lurking in the periphery of all these characters that we meet in neil simon's work so uh, you know that de- therefore i in fact like you to um, you know look at uh, some of the Uh, points about uh, neil simon as well he was a comic writer and used humor very well and humor isn't wasn't something for him to just entertain the people around him of course he was a, bro- a broadway writer so he had to um, br- bring in the element of entertainment and yet uh, simon i outlined the quality of humor in his works a- in the following manner and i quote from and you should be able to see it on your screens that humor isn't anything if it can't make you think and feel anyone can make a baby laugh by shaking a rattle in its face I don't want to ride for infants and shake rattles unquote so you see this is the writer that we are dealing with that here is the writer who's all who already knows that the depression years the uh, the bronx reality the jewish reality is a part of his person and that 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 remains and that shows in his work and yet the style that he takes of comedy of um bathos of humor you know creating constantly the the the, the pitching a kind of a tragic scene and then taking it to the ridiculous you know and uh, making it more anti climactic all of this is done in order to uh, you know in order to bring the reader back to the point of thinking you know so humor is very much present as you read you know in dialogues in situations that there's that are comic and yet in characters very make up you know the the a tragic character often appears comic in his play you know but even when you can sympathize with the tragedy of this person you you almost always look at him more comically than otherwise so uh, the idea is to be able to evaluate constantly to be to be able to sympathize that is to feel and then to draw back and to think you know the fact that he says humor needs to make you think and feel which means that feeling is not denied it's it's not like a kind of a satiric piece so you do feel for the character and the moment and the moment that when you feel that it's getting very intense he brings you back and throws in some humor some comic situation so that you know it it becomes light in mood so and, and then you you come back to thinking about the life and the predicament of the character so you know the thinking and feeling aspect of the, his comedies the, uh, it's quite unique you know in the sense that you feel for the character and yet you draw yourself out of the play and you think about the predicament of this particular what, what exactly is he drawing the attention of uh, the audience to because when you when, when you talk about thinking then, then he would have certain issues in his mind regarding helplessness uh, loneliness uh, not able to relate you know with with the world around you but what does he make uh, what what does he make us think so you see he's basically Which aspect of life that is so in all if i were to say then he's bringing alive you know this urban middle class milieu of the time mm-hmm. so it is the urban middle class milieu that he brings alive and he uses humor to in actually enhance um this particular 
this kind of predicament or this kind of dilemma that characters go through mm-hmm. and and there is humor inbuilt in life right mm-hmm. and it this humor then is used to uh, is used in a manner used to good effect that it it begins to show the dilemmas of characters their contradictions mm-hmm. you know how contradictions uh, how characters are contra- uh, you know very contradictory uh, saying one thing doing another being together one desiring need of something and yet the rejection of it you know so it's like a bundle and a jumble that that a character is and to, to be able to look at it humorously you you don't really also you know humor also disallows you in that sense to judge, judge characters mm-hmm. the moment you become you begin to judge characters humor comes in and takes that away you know you 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 then take it in in the stride and you so go question, along with it questions are serious and the treatment is light the treatment is light right mm-hmm. so so the question is serious but you know you don't think that you are out there looking at some intense portrayal of life it's mm-hmm. almost like in fact in um, S- uh, simon's play nothing really happens in that sense much like you know in for instance in pinter or others also much not much really happens in terms of plot but again uh, the idea uh, you know it's it's about the projection of attitudes and the projection of value systems that he is after you know the american consciousness of the time is what he is trying to portray on stage and and that is a difficult thing you know uh, how do you portray american consciousness for instance on the stage Mm-hmm. through plot through actions mm-hmm. there are just dialogues of uh, characters here they are just talking amongst themselves mm-hmm. and yet you can see how people at that particular time are thinking what is their mindset like what are the values that they attach to things what is uh, 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 you know what is their moral fiber like and if there is any kind of a moral fiber in fact what he is trying to show is that america has not been able to sustain a kind of a desirable life and that uh, the quality of life has really diminished in this kind of american uh, culture and it is to do with the culture itself so uh, what is the role of culture for instance in society what is it supposed to really do in society uh, is it supposed to build a kind of um, Uh, a group that that can look up to the future that can feel enthused about the future and yet there is there is there is this group uh, you would see of characters who are really who are hopeful perhaps but more often they are stuck in their reality you know and they're stuck in their present and mm. they try to find whatever way they can to come out of the this kind of uh, overbearing sort of reality outside the outside their homes so which is also the reason why he uh, you know spoke about relationships family marriage you know and and the breaking apart of these things you know and how they are unable to uh, hold on to uh, people are unable to hold on to these systems whether they be family marriage or uh, friendships or other relationships in life so i think mm-hmm. he's uh, bringing to us this kind of an um, urban middle class milieu but also suggesting also showing us the disorder that exists in this urban middle class setting you use the word absurd at one or two places mm-hmm. and uh, he is an exact contemporary of uh, harold pinter mm-hmm. and uh, a bit junior to uh, samuel beckett and uh, all these uh, people you know share that background of the uh, 1950s mm-hmm. because post world post second world war right. so do you think that there is that that the streak of uh, the 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 absurd in his writing i think he is very real and material mm-hmm. so unlike beckett who could spin his entire play around you know the the very the mental sort of um ideas right or he could he could just build an entire narrative or build an entire play around uh just going into the philosophical question of uh living right mm. and or the uselessness of living or the inability of people to connect with one another and talk about it in, in all in philosophical sense right that, that's a very good insight into the uh plays of the absurd yeah mm. so you know they they deal with things at the level of the mind you mm. know and mm. but uh, neil simon is not somebody who is talking about the uh the uselessness of living or he's not contemplating he's mm. showing in reality that when people begin to talk then they are talking uh at one another and even when they are talking at one another no one can really make any sense and i think in that sense he's closer to pinter because pinter uh in his conversations does the same you know mm. he tries to use dialogues to say that uh, language is really a kind of cover and a facade that we use to 
uh, say, not say things that we really want to say mm -hmm. and that characters really don't say things that they want to say uh, what they say is not what they mean mm -hmm. you know so uh, Pinter exp exp you know explodes the very idea of language and the linguistic structure that actually disallows meaning in that sense and doesn't uh, really let people uh, speak their minds and that people you know are thinking something but Neil Simon in that sense is is exactly saying his characters are exactly saying what they mean you know and so what so it's not like he's trying to say something else through the words that they are uh, mm. that they uh, you know that they are using or he's trying to go into the philosophical question he's too real he's too he's too much um, he's captured the pulse of the time mm. so as people speak what people speak people are taking a dig at one another they also talk in the open they are able to say the things that they want to say in, uh, in you know in a moment when when they are not able to hold on to things so he's able to use language creatively i think and to be able to say so absurdity is there certainly but where is that absurdity as you uh, say absurdity is not uh, in this ki absurdity exists in uh, this kind of interaction that you know people are trying to understand one another and not being able to and and the absurdity is in the fact that they are too well aware of the outside world and their choice to not acknowledge it their choice to leave it behind you know so it's it's in a way an escapism of sorts if you like it and an escape into the world of romance and escape into the hist in into history and escape into a game that they play in 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 sports you know the whole culture of sports has also been looked at now very interestingly in the american sphere that you know when when people just come together they probably grab a drink and they sit before the tv and watch sports now what is the relevance of that that's mm. their way of connecting with one another because they can no more talk to one another mm. and uh, this culture of talking no more exists you know it's about hanging together hanging in together now sports is a kind of an escape route for them uh, through which they can actually uh, you know find uh, you know find release from the present realities the daunting world that they live in so i think mm. that's that that is the area where how i look at it mm. Uh, from your uh, analysis, uh, what, what I derive uh, as, as a point of argument is that uh, his drama is uh, a little more social than the drama of the uh, people who were called under the category of uh, the theatre of the absurd. Where they they Certainly. talked about the individual, but th this person is talking about a very live, very dynamic society. Yes, very dynamic society. I think that's the right word I'd like to use. That it's a very lively, dynamic society where people are just dealing with so much, you know, that they are unable to even process it in their minds, and yet they are uh, dealing with it. You know, so he shows relationships. He shows how uh, foolish people can be in relationships, and how weird they can be, and how insufferable one another can be, and yet the desire to be together you know and that's what also makes it comic you see mm -hmm. it would be tragic if you said that you know there are people who find one another insufferable and then they can't live with one another and they decide you know they part ways and maybe one of them so you know there are moments where you feel uh, that you know the character is going to do something major and this is going to be a tragic play and yet he withdraws from that sphere and makes character get over their whatever problems and then they can move on and move to the next stage of life because finally they have only them you know and they realize that even though uh, you know even though uh, he grew up in and had the trauma of a broken family because his parents slip split you know he, al he he says he mentions at one place i always saw them coming together and splitting again you know the so uh, in this very fact you know of coming mm -hmm. together and splitting again is the inability and the desire to be there you know so the need to be together and the inability to be live, to be able to live together mm -hmm. so i think it is dynamic and positive and that is what makes his place comic so friends uh, <coughs> uh, in this part of the lecture uh, professor richa bajaj has talked about the general features of uh, neil simon's drama his dram dramatic practice and that this can straight away uh, be linked with the larger you know frame in which you know uh, she she would be now putting the uh, text uh, th that she has to focus on so uh, it's it's a good point uh, you are sharing very fine insights and uh, uh, let let's see how you elaborate uh, things further in the second part of our discussion thank you thank you